Discover how smarter project insights can lead to better project outcomes. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you back. And today we have a full house as usual. Um, it's good to see everybody here and Chippy. Mr. Dale, that is a fantastic purple shirt you're wearing today. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed this. You know, some of us work hard, you know, Val. We're not all in Australia putting our feet up and relaxing on the beach. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough, mate. And uh, Martin, how are you, mate? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, I'm just shocked to see Dale in a shirt. That's really, that's really strange. <laughs> I'd be shocked to see Dale without a shirt. What are you talking about, man? Yeah, exactly, Martin. <laughs> Come on. Do you want me to be naked or what? <laughs> oh, jeez. We started, started off well. Good, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we started strong. But let's introduce our guest, uh, a guest and veteran uh, of the pod and, and a great supporter. A uh, big fan of you, Steve. Steve Wake, welcome to the show. How are you, mate? I'm good. Very good. Uh, time uh, look, yeah, exactly. Well, look, we'll try and keep it painless but i know you're passionate about this subject so we'll, we'll get you started and um and i know once we get you started we can't stop you so let's get into standards and um, project control standards we've been talking about for a while dale we we've always wanted a, a playbook uh, something to benchmark against and to be honest um sometimes there was nothing really to guide us i think for a long time um but then steve you know you have been probably more influential than most in the evm and project control space uh, where does standards start and how do we get uh, standards for project control? <clears throat> well, let me take you back 30 years. Oh, and please. my initial foray into standards started when I decided to take responsibility for, well, for both myself and for the project community by thinking we should introduce earned value mm -hmm. into the UK. And I, I, I've always had a, I think, a strategic approach with, and again, I, I say that with hindsight, I now realise that I've always had a strategic approach. And uh, the, the route I got was, um, and this is 95, 1995. Um, I'm not sure whether Dale was born yet. Um, <laughs> he, he might have had a bit more hair. Uh, then. Definitely. Um, but I think I, I've, I, the, the story I've related is that I, I got so interested in it that I gave up working for Artemis, who I was working for, because I got fed up being told to go out and earn revenue every month and mm. rip customers off through variation orders and things. And, you know, again, that's exactly the same nowadays, I imagine. Um, not so much Artemis, but, but generally. Uh, and I, I, I disliked that. I, I thought that was against the duty of care of the professional, even then. So I decided to become a niche consultant um, on the back of having read an article about um, the proper conduct of public business, which led me to both the audit office and the public accounts committee. And then I discovered also that um, the BSI, British Standards Institution, were writing what ended up being BS 6079, the Guide to Project Management, which I was told it's not a standard, it's a guide. It was always 6079, it's not a standard, it's a guide. It's for information, you don't have to do it, which always struck me as a bit odd because I, you know, most people think a standard's something that thou shalt. It's a tab mm. tablet of stone. Well, it wasn't. I suppose the proof of the pudding is that 30 years later, people within the project community know about it a bit, but it's not in general use. There aren't any really training courses on it. It's not, it's not folded into contract. It's not, it's not a thou shalt document at all, uh, despite the fact that it's been revised three or four times already. Anyway, the digression is that within this particular document and associated with it was a guy who was working for Rolls-Royce at the time, um, he doesn't work for them anymore, so I, I will cite his name because he became a very good friend. His name was Nick Colling. And he was based at Derby. And uh, I got I was introduced really to Rolls-Royce because they were using Earn Value. So that's how I got to know mm -hmm. him. 
And he said, oh, we're, we're, we're doing a, a British standard on uh, project management. I, uh, we're thinking about doing some pages on earned value. And I said, that's a great idea. So why don't you fold these pages on earned value into, uh, um, into the standard? So long story short, four pages appeared um, about earned value within the British standard on um, uh, uh, project management. Now that meant that it was at least a document you could wave at somebody and say, it's real, it must be true, it's, a British, it's in the British standard. I then collared uh, them along with the Auditor General to come along and keynote my very first conference to support and promote earned value. And in fact, it had a BSI logo on it. And it was actually, I think the, the actual working title of the conference was BS6079 Guide to Project Management. And that was, that was EVA1, as it is. We'll talk mm. about it a bit later, but we're just about to do EVA26. So that shows you how long ago it was. But how I kind of realized at the time that these were instruments for change. And similarly, the audit office, who I got dragged into after telling them about earned value, um, they incorporated pages about earned value in what they call their VFM report. They were, they, they were editing, they were auditing Eurofighter at the time. And the prime suspects in that audit were BAE and Rolls-Royce. And the audit office's problem at the time was they had so much data. They were, in fact, it's a, it's, a, it's a classic trick, apparently, in audits. If you don't really want to, people like auditors to discover what you're doing, you just give them all the data you've got. Data analytics, people, please listen. You give them all that you, you, you shower them, you drown them in data so that they can't see the wood for the trees. And the audit office were at the stage where they just didn't have a clue how to disentangle the trolleys of what were then paper prints of data about the, 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 pro, the, the project. So my phone call to them, and you could phone them up in those days and get put through by an operator. I spoke to uh, a lowly audit manager whose name was Tim Banfield. And he, he went on to become, I think, the first head of profession for the, what was the major projects authority and then the infrastructure and projects authority many, many years afterwards, but we, we, we again stayed in contact and, and touched throughout. Uh, so having said user and value and being an Artemis consultant at the time, I said, by the way, our two customers or two of our customers, and I was in the aerospace and defense bit, are using earned value. And they went, really? And they went and asked BAE Systems why, and Rolls-Royce why they hadn't shared that fact, particularly when they were auditing Eurofighter, and the, the answer they got uh, initially was, well, it's not in the contract. We don't have to tell you this because it's not in the contract. So get lost, politely. And what followed was uh, a game of Mexican standoff where there was this, well, you know, do you think you could share this data with us so that we had a get a better picture of the status of the project? And the first people who blinked to their credit was Rolls-Royce and they started to uh, share their EV data um, to, to show and demonstrate the status on that project. And from then, you know, that, that, uh, and that many, all those years ago, 26 years ago, was where the sort of earned value thread got taken up gradually, firstly by therefore supply and contracting suppliers. And then this story was leveraged into the MOD via a couple of meetings that I have with Michael Portilla, uh, who I pitched earned value at and said, you know, you're Minister for Defence, why aren't you using earned value? You should, it would be great if you could do that. And he listened, and whilst he didn't do anything specifically, he, I think, enabled me to get in there and tell them about it, which opened a few doors, and uh, it was what I, I, I call the depth, the depth charge approach, which is you go as high as you can into the organisation, convince somebody that it's a good idea, get them to go and shake a few uh, people up. Um, and then the idea like the depth charge goes in at the top and as it explodes, it goes right the way all through the levels of the organization until it hits, in fact, the, air, the level that I was operating at. 
and suddenly overnight it went from get lost it was to please don't ask the minister anymore just come and see us and we'll talk to you and that that is what happened and then the earned value story rolled on so i could but inherent in there somewhere was a british standard mm. uh, and the you know the ability of uh, me thinking there's 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 power in instruments there's there's power in things that appear to be almost legal documents if you like that carry great weight and are just the sort of thing that you need to wave at somebody you know rather than a knife or money you you you, you wave a standard at them and, and it, it, there, there's a degree of respectability of authority or integrity uh, that, 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 that makes people at least listen and pay attention you know to, to your ideas so that's the opening story do you want to ask me a question or talk about that? Have you had any no, experience with that? <laughs> so that's chapter one. It. I'm just going to refresh. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Grab a grab a beverage. You're doing well so far. Uh, so with standards in particular, and and obviously we'll, we'll get into various parts yeah. of it, but just for a baseline, you know, are standards required to be written into contracts to be compliant, or do standards have their own benchmark? And how do we how do we get people to comply yeah. with them? Um, well, again, there's a there's a there's a variety of answers um, to to that, and um, I think it, it's a truth in in projects, in any form of business, that um, everybody's nice to each other until something goes wrong, and then what happens? Well, the contract comes out, you know. So even on the most Pally relationships, when push comes to shove, if it ain't in the contract, it won't get done. If it is in the contract, it will get done. Mm -hmm. Or you can have a nice fight about it and make some money by taking people to court. So I, I, I'm a firm believer in um, that difference between, I suppose, being nice and being fair. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a great believer in uh, equitability fairness in contractors you know i was always taught that the law is about consent it's not about compulsion and that it, and that it reinforces behavior but in a good way rather than a bad way or it should be like that um i think unfortunately the way that lots of contracts are put together they're very adversarial so that there have to be these protections in law they're adversarial because there's a big game of cheating going on generally within bids. You know, people bid low to win the business and then spend the, uh, the life of the project finding things that are wrong with it so that they can slap extras on with scope and change orders and God knows what else, which again always creates a, a deeply suspicious adversarial, often very jokey, but, 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 but very darkly jokey atmosphere on a project when everybody realises that everybody's trying to pull a fast one on each other. Mm. Um, there have been attempts to open that up, but again, in a in a society that you know uh, favours shareholder value over societal benefit, you, you're never really going to pull away from that. Um, or indeed, you you may pull away from that again if you change some of some of the I don't know where some of the big spends on uh, of taxpayers' money are, which it, which is infrastructure which are the, you know, the, the environment that we live in, the, the way we travel, the way we uh, uh, conduct our lives, um, the things that, you know, the government ought to be spending money on. And uh, at the, the minute I use the nationalisation word, I know that somebody will accuse me of being, being a socialist, for which read shorthand for communist, you know, which, for which read, you know, agent provocateur. <clears throat> but I, I think tied up within, you know, the, the current ethos or thinking of social benefit or um or, or try and trying to make that work against the background of climate change and carbon zero um there have to be forces at play to try and make that come true so um i'm i'm, I'm going a little bit off piece but it is very much upon the turf that that, that, that i'm endeavoring to operate and influence so if i wind forward um to about five years ago now, it feels like five years, it might be four. Uh, I had joined um, through my, um, well, 
what had happened. I've been invited to uh, create and work on um, and do, well, I'll, I'll, I'll even correct that now, having thought about it. In my life at the APM, I, I, I refounded the Earned Value SIG because apparently the Earned Value SIG had appeared for the wink of an eye about, you know, even before Dale had hair, um, for about three nanoseconds, disappeared. And then I came along, and after I'd been doing Earned Value on my own with my conference going along, after about, that was 95, in about 98, I approached the APM and said, uh, well, actually, I approached the PMI and said, could I do an earned value SIG in, in, in the UK? They said, get stuff. We've already done it, even though we're based in Philadelphia. You know, you don't need to have an English version of it. So I then went to the APM and said, can I have an earned value SIG? And they said, yes, please come and do it. And we're, we're at that time massively helpful and supportive. And I paid great tribute to, again, uh, a guy called Jim Gordon. It was a very eccentric, um, trigger happy with his temper bloke who um, ha also happened to be the chairman of MS2 uh, at BSI at the time. But he was also the, he was the treasurer, I think, for, for the APM. And he, he was a you know, great supporter, a great deal of help. Um, this, was, this, again, was when the APM occupied a, a house which was just above the Tory Party Association in High Wycombe. Uh, which is just outside of London for, 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 for you, Val. And um, they make High Wycombe famous for making furniture, I think. And they uh, supported me. And through the life of the, the APMC, we produced loads and loads of documentation. One of which, the APM guidelines, I, I shipped off and flew to San Diego to, uh, that's in America now, and um, near, nearer to you actually than to me, mm -hmm. and pitched, or was invited to pitch at the NDIA, the National Defense Industrial Association, who were the stewards of um, the ANSI standard for earn value 748. And I pitched at them, could you please make our guidelines reciprocal with yours? And they said, yes. Uh, 2003, maybe. And um, they said yes, which meant that I could come back with a little bit of paper saying, and uh, our guidelines can be used as a as a as a as a standard instrument because it's got, it has reciprocity with a, a, a another national standard, which happened to be the US, uh, which was great because the, it was our standards then started getting slotting into getting slotted into contracts. So reference to our guidelines started appearing in, I do know, uh, Ministry of Defence uh, contracts. Mm -hmm. So that was, that again, was the power of the standard. And I'm, I'm getting there, Val, to, to the answer. Um, I was also, because I, I, I was friendly with many camps, was invited to put together the practice standard or be an author for the practice standard for own value that PMI produced as well. So I was an author there. And then on the back of that, I uh, ultimately got invited seven or eight years ago, it must be now, to be on the work group for the international standard that developed the EVM standard, the ISO standard, and the WBS standard, the ISO standard. And in order to do that, I had to become a member of um, MS2 on, for the BSI to do that. But at that time, I, I paid no attention whatsoever to what the BSI was doing. All I wanted to do was go and work on this ISO standard. But you had to be a BSI Management Standards Committee member in order to mm. do that. So I did that for a few years, finished that, finished that work up, was still a member of the committee. And then on a particularly um, quiet day, there was, a, there was an MS2 meeting. I thought, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll actually go down to Chiswick which is where their HQ is, and go and sit in on a meeting because I haven't really turned up to one for about a year. There, there are only two or three a year anyway, uh, and they're very agenda-driven things. You don't do any work per se on standards. You just talk about what's going on and, and uh, what the work plan is and, and stuff like that. And so I wandered in and we got, uh, and again, it was quite classic, agenda driven meeting with points of order and, and what have you but we got the interesting bit was that when somebody uh towards the end of the meeting said 
uh, we now have a section called new work, new standards. And I've been mulling some things over and um, nobody else put their hand up. So I put my hand up and said, I would like to propose that MS2 starts to develop a standard in project controls, benefits management, and an implementation guide to EVM. And in actual fact, I'd gone there, again at the urgings of one of my panel members, to pitch for an implementation guide to earn value. Because it would have been a way of leveraging um, onto the work that had been done at the, at the ISO level, the international standards level, to see if we could get one done. Because again, ISO had never, within the context of management standards, done an implementation guide standard. You know, an implementation guide is what it says. It's a, it's a how to do it document. Mm. ISO don't do that. Well, wonder of wonders, and it takes about three to six months for these things to, to churn through. Um, they all came true. And I got the three standards through two proposal systems. One was that controls and benefits um, were um, allowed to proceed uh, to, to become standards. And the implementation guide to earn value, after having been initially challenged, um, Got, got lifted up immediately, as can happen, to have direct work started uh, as an ISO standard. And so the cachet there, the carrot is that first we got it, you know, as the as the proposers through to to become an international standard. So leapfrogging it being a national standard that then gets converted into an international standard. Um, but also because it was allowed to be called an implementation standard. So again, we've been working on that for three years, nearly four years now. Um, uh, still got another couple of years to go. It's a massive document, which we're trying to reduce. It's about 350 pages at the moment. We're trying to bring it down to, to about 200. But um, it's, it's going to be the first proper implementation standard that the, that the, uh, the, the, the ISO have, have approved. And of course, we've got great hopes that that will serve as a good reboot or a, a, a reconfigure of what earned value does. Now, mm. back to the, the room which says you can go and do controls and um, benefits management. Why had I done that? Well, I had a friend and I, I, I continued and maintained a very good relationship with the audit office over the years. And as the, the various person who was uh, responsible for, for, for major project uh, audit uh, came, and, came and went, um, there was one particular one, again, about four years ago, who alerted me to the fact, and I, we'd meet a couple of times a year to just discuss what was going on and what was of interest in, in the world of projects and audit and stuff. And I was alerted to a report, which I often refer to in presentation, which was the audit office's auditing report of project, projects exiting the major projects program of the government and their assessment of how well they'd done. OK, so these were projects that were finishing up and exiting the program because they've been done. And the bone of contention was, and it's something that I've been talking uh, about with, with them, uh, with the audit office, was that um, when a project is created in government nowadays, there has to be a business case. And the business case has to gain approval, and it also has to contain a, a benefits realization map. And the issue that was coming out was that yes, you'd get that, the benefit value, the benefit metric will be stated in order to get through, which was normally a number, which was needed to get through the stage gate. And um, it would get so it would get through the stage gate, project would be done. Project finished, audit office goes in, says, oh, this project should have yielded 
200 million pounds worth of benefits. Where are they? I don't know. Mm. Couldn't find them. You know, there was a, a massive shortfall, quite generally, in the amounts of benefits that were stated categorically with the purpose of the project in the business case, which weren't being realized or hadn't been realized by the time they'd exited the program, by which time all the all the uh, guilty and the responsible or whoever, you know, nobody was responsible. Nobody could be pinned down or was accountable for these numbers and or, or indeed generally is still. So I, I listened very hard to that. And, uh, and, and the real key statement in, in this particular report, which really got me, was uh, it said that spending departments should own the benefits until they are delivered. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that, <laughs> apart from the obvious, it means that quite often, um, well, firstly, they should own them until they're delivered anyway. Right, so you've you've stated what they are, you've got them through the project, and we come and audit you. You know, you've got to be able to tell us what's happened to them. Mm. But for me, the the further significance of the statement was that benefits are often realised only after the project has been delivered. The the classic example that I use is, you know, a hospital is only a building until operations start. The, the value, the benefit, the beneficial impact doesn't occur until the bricks and mortar get turned into something working with a purpose. And that can be after the project, i.e. the building, has been delivered. Now, what the audit office are implying, recommending, is that those benefits somehow, there should be a line that allows those benefits to be monitored and measured throughout the life of the benefit realization that could be arguably 10 20 30 years down the line from when 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 the project's realized uh, and also it struck me that what you also needed was a a continuum a line from cradle to grave so that when the minister or somebody has the bright idea that we're going to improve something or we're going to level up the country not only are we going to quantify what that leveling up is going to equal, but we're going to track it right the way through until it's delivered. And if we've said that that delivery is going to take place over the next 50 years, then by God, we're going to track it from now till 50 years hence, when Dale will probably be about 40 or something like that, I imagine. <laughs> so I'm, I'm applying yeah. maths here, politicians. Yeah, no, I'm impressed. Uh, so, I think you got it. Steve, did you get a fax as well? I heard a, I heard a printer or something. A uh, printer that... just printed off, yeah. Yeah, that's my, oh, okay. that's my wife telling me stuff in French. Um, so what, what, so I, the idea was in my head. It was I need to track. Well, firstly, I'm really interested in the idea that benefits only really can only occur once, uh, uh, um, once the project has been delivered. Very often, all the project does is create the, pet, the, create the potential for a benefit to arrive, okay? But yeah. without the project, you, you'll never get the benefit. So you have to have the project, you have to have the artifact or the mechanism or the process uh, uh, to, 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 to begin to, to, to use that benefit. And again, I tip my hat to uh, a Kiwi who, who's quite close to you now, if, if, you've, if your geography is okay, called Phil Driver. I don't know whether you've had him on the program, Phil Driver um, created this really simple approach to benefits called PRUB, P-R-U-B, which stood for project, result, i.e. what the project produces, use and benefit. And it's a model that he applied to all sorts of social and civil projects uh, in New Zealand initially. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that, that, that was the sequence. You have to visualize what the benefit is. You have to visualize what the project is to create the benefit. Then you use the, the, the result in order to, 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 to get the benefit. 
crossword doers will spot that prub spelt backwards is burp. <laughs> B-U-R-P. And essentially, again, you w w with prub, you basically go to the end, say, well, that's the outcome, that's the purpose, that's the visualization of the benefit. We will work, we then go to that and then work back to figure out how, it, how it's used, what the results of a project will be. So in order to define what the project is itself, if you like, to, 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 to actually create the, to create the beneficial impact. So you have a kind of a proper visualization of what the, if you like, the storyboard of, or a storyboard of what the, the life of the, the, uh, the, the benefit from concept to, to, to realization to death is uh, of it. So I, that, that really struck home at me really strongly several years ago. And, and Phil's written a couple of books about, uh, about this. And um, I um, took, took that thinking very much to heart. And so was looking for ways of, of, of linking that to uh, projects and project delivery. And again, we all know that the delivery of projects is all about the delivery of scope. And I was thinking, well, surely you, you could deliver, you, you could track and monitor benefits in the same way, couldn't you? You know, if you if you've got a, if you've got a monetized benefit, and the monetized benefit can be spread out over time, you've got a sing, you've got a single line, like you do for an earned value line or a, a plan line on on a graphic. Well, surely if you if you can spread that over time in the same way, and you're a controls guy. You can monitor it in the same way that you're doing your scope progress. Well, why can't you do that for the arrival mm. and realization of benefits over time too? And give those same sort of variance reports. I, you know, the benefits not arriving or it's going to be late, or because again, benef benefit benefits can be affected by scope in two uh, by scope delivery in two ways. One is that the cost of the scope begins to eat into the the, the, the financial value of the benefit to be delivered therefore reducing the, the, the impact or the viability of the benefit, even to the extent that sometimes the cost of the scope completely consumes the benefit, uh, so that it's not even worth doing it, maybe. Or it slips so far to the right, that it's going to be so late that by the time you get it, the benefit's just never going to you know, be there. So there are, there are two distinct uh, 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 bits of relationship with the delivery of project scope that were it, but you know, for the fact that you could say, well, if we want these benefits to, to, to come into society, let's track and monitor the delivery concurrently with the projects that are supposed to be delivering or creating the potential for those things to arrive. Just so, on that, uh, Steve, yeah. sorry, just, uh, just to jump in there. Uh, and a great point, actually, when you said, um, you know, who, who, who owns or re who's responsible for benefits is a good point because after the project's finished, you know, the, the project teams dusted their hands, everyone's high-fived. And, uh, and then it's, it just ends up in this abyss. My, my question yeah. was, and you, you might be getting to it already, um, who would be collecting the information to pro progress a program on benefits if it was, let's say, a project controls? Because we have the skills for that. We love tracking things, but yeah. who would be coll collating that on it? Because some of these projects are massive. As you said, some yeah. of these benefits are going to realize 10, 20, 50 years later. Yeah. Um, are we going to have a young Dale sitting there until he's gray like you? Um, I'm looking well, at the benefits program. I think we'll probably have an avatar because it'll be a AI or something like that by then. Metaverse. I think, yeah. uh, well, I'm, I, I was nearly there. So I, I'd, I'd, I'd said that in my head, it would, um, we, we could plug um, uh, a benefits line into the day to day of the controls community, couldn't we? Be easy in terms of actually doing the job, because again, mm. the controls guy don't. Act, the controls guy don't guys don't actually have to create the benefit or calculate it. They just have to take the the, the, the numbers and, and and make uh, and assess their their arrival in some way and and co collect the data as you rightly say, or somebody has to. So again, with with the the wheels to uh, and this again is this is thinking that was in my head before I, if you like, took advantage of being able to march into a. Uh, a BSI meeting, stick my hand up and say, let's do project controls, please, and benefits mm. uh, and earn value. Because in actual fact, the solution really was that if we were right in the same way that we were using earn value to, to, to assess uh, project status progress uh, in, in a very well-ordered way, also out of the woodwork had come a guy called Kick Piney, 
whose real name is Crispin Piney. And um, he worked at CERN for a while, uh, and uh, I think was uh, maybe something to do with IBM at some point, lives in France, down south. And he wrote a bloody great big textbook called Guess What? Earned Benefit. Uh, and again, four or five years ago, big textbook, and it it, prom it basically it converted all the sort of earned benefit techniques into a fourth line on the curve. Simon Taylor, take note. Mm. Fourth curve. And um, I again, great idea. He was actually eaten up by CPM, the College of Performance Management, and bunged on as a keynote speaker in uh, in the states college performance management um the, the the american guys who represent the american industry for earned value doing most of the big major government uh, department of defense um uh projects using earned value and I, I again it was brought to my notice i hunted him down had him over got him on to the pmi synergy conference uh Look, again, looking at look, looking at those ideas and then trying to seek a way of how you could potentially put that, that, that fourth curve on and, and still am. But I, I, I thought, uh, so, so this brings us to, to, to kind of, so, so the, 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 these things to, to, to take account of. You, you've got an earned benefit textbook basically lining out how you could have a fourth curve on the, on the graphic. You've got the audit office saying you really should be monitoring right the way through the life cycle. Uh, there's something that there's earned value, which I believe is a tremendous framework uh, for um, uh, the, the monitoring and control of major projects, which lends itself very well to uh, a common assessment of, of, of the government's uh, uh, and therefore the taxpayers' spending on, on, on major projects uh, on, on a national basis, um, uh, and also contains so much data that it would um, consume the the interest of the data analytics freaks forever if they were about to spend their time doing that as, 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 rather than doing hacks. Um, so doing that properly would give them all the data they could ever wish for um, in, in, in projects. And again, that's another thread. I will do a little digression and say to the data analytics people, why don't you create a common project data format? Uh, first 10 lines common to everybody, 30 extra user fields for your own purposes, share that or feed into that from your own systems. So the first 10 fields are commonly shared or available to everybody. You can lock the fields down if you want to have a certain degree of lack of transparency or secrecy or uniqueness about the data, or you could turn those fields on or anonymize them in some way. And if you had a common data format, you could do all the data analytics you ever really wanted to do. And if you really think hard about it, just think, well, how many different types of record are there in, in, in data, in projects for data anyway? Cost, time, schedule, quality. Yeah, not many. A dozen. Mm -hmm. Well, make that. Spend your time, you know, have a hackathon creating your, your project data format. I guarantee that the BSI would gladly enshrine that in something and make it commonly available for everybody to use. I digress, but again, it's a, it's a significant part of an effort of, of, of getting a lot of this stuff joined up. Um, so we, uh, so I said, okay, controls. Let's create a control standard that goes beyond scope. Let's have a benefits management standard to reinforce that if we can, or the start of a benefits management st standard that, that can reinforce that, and is an instrument that is above all of the bodies of knowledge and professional codes of conduct of all the institutions and the associations as such, so that it would become far more in the nature of public commons that could be freely accepted by the entire, by the project community, the stakeholder community, the government community, um, without batting an eyelid or having a turf war about it. Uh, and so the great thing I feel about the British Standards Institution is that it is still recognized as a, an impartial, powerful body with a, a big, strong voice, 
And um, when asked the question, as I have of the community that I know, would you rather have a British standard about project controls or would you rather your choose any association you like? Would you rather they did one? And the resounding answer is, we'd rather a British standard, please. Why would you do it any other way if you could? Because otherwise, there's a there's a, a, a bun fight the level below, as everybody's jo as everybody jockeys for turf and position, and they're not jockeying for turf and position in order to um, be seen as the champions of the underdog or the champions of national standards or the champions of improvement of project delivery that can help the taxpayer and benefit society. They're interested in it because they normally want to monetize what it is that they do. Yeah. And they're seeking to add value to their own communities by being the ones that give the, the badge or the certification or the insurance regime or whatever it is you want to call it. The great thing about the BSI is we're agnostic. Oh, I forgot to mention maybe, I've recently been promoted to chairman of MS2, the Management Standards Group, uh, something that I never 30 years ago imagined that I would be. Well done, Steve. But I am now responsible for that part of management called Project Program and Portfolio Standards. And I shall be for the next three years unless I get run over or shot if that accident <laughs> happens to me that people have been predicting. Um, and I know that I can renew it for another three years if I'm still alive. So I... Um, uh, would say again to, to, to people that really seriously want to take an interest in in making things better the whole point of the standards community is that anybody can participate if they're interested in the elaboration of a standard and the creation of a standard so um, again an open invitation if there are representatives of APM who already do participate PMI uh, ICE, IET, IMACE, ICME, uh, ACOSTE, um, whatever the management people say, as it, what, what's um, CIM, uh, any of these can put up a representative and share uh, impartially and independently the elaboration of a standard that can be then used by all, leveraged into use by all, and created by all. But I have also experienced, and to a degree I'm also guilty, of seeing uh, standards come into uh, being. And sometimes those standards aren't, their purpose isn't particularly strong or particularly well communicated. And we politely nod at its arrival. Um, we may even be around in the group that's, that, that's put it together. But you don't see a great deal of activity on the part of the potential beneficiaries of that standard doing much to pull it into use, to pull it into life, to support it, to champion it, to say, we're going to use that, we must use that, we'll do those sorts of things. Can I jump in there, Steve? Yeah. On that point, then, the, the thing I'm struggling with, particularly when you say benefits are realized years and years after the actual thing is produced and we need to measure this how can we link project delivery to benefits realization so how do we know at a point in time in a project when we won't start to deliver when we'll will cease or the the benefits that will be delivered are lowered how can we make that link that's what i'm struggling with because surely, specifically when, you, when you're talking about technology, maybe construction's a bit easier, but if you're talking about the tech space and you're delivering a certain technology, let's say it's a rail signaling upgrade program that's over multi-years, and <clears throat> the technology changes and COVID hits and your passenger numbers change. And so all of a sudden that landscape changes, but you're three, four, five years into a project is going to take another three, four, five years to deliver. And then the benefits need to last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. 
mm-hmm. how do we link today's delivery into the decades of future benefits? Well, because it's normally embedded, well, okay. I know there are several approaches to benefits and some of them focus entirely on what happens when the projects are aligned. Um, I personally, that, that doesn't really interest me because that, that that's kind of like going back to Taylorism and um, uh, efficiency improvements, which don't need benefits to, to uh, really get at. And, and in some ways, I think a, a lot of the language of benefits is just tied up in the fact that people don't know about work study um, uh, and should maybe revi- revisit some of those principles. What I'm really interested in are those things that are looking ahead and that do have a beneficial societal impact potentially and do definitely have a life beyond the the construction phase, if you like, of the project, whether that's the build of IT or whether it's the build of the the bricks and mortar. And I go back to my own value and my own benefit thing, which is what Kit was was creating was a curve that went way to the right of the, the project because embedded in the initial business case of a government business plan isn't the life cycle of a project, it's the life of the intended social benefit that's going to, you know, get 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 created because because somebody, a minister, decided that an amount of money is going to be put forward in a business case to make that benefit happen 10, 20, 30 years down. And as I said, uh, what Kick demonstrated very ably in his book was that you could convert that, you could monetize that into a curve. And in the same way that you have a work breakdown structure for scope, you could have a benefit breakdown structure. It was also a set of time phase bricks, you know, equating beneath the curve 100% of the value of the perceived benefit. You know, the reason why you've, you've put, you know, you put, I don't know, you've invested 10 billion pounds in order to create a benefit that's going to be 50 billion pounds over a time. But you have that curve and the curve says today it's 2022 and this benefit is going to be around until 2075. OK, so you spread that curve somehow or the benefit realization across that time, which gives you the ability to monitor that over time if you have systems uh, in place to to do that. And you track and monitor that um, uh, quite, uh, and there there, there must be ways, there are ways of measuring social impact. Um, All I'm asking the controls community to do is to be part of the vehicle or the continuum to, 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 to take that figure and create a, and to assess variance against it. So that um, in certain, co- uh, in certain uh, uh, projects, the, the, the benefit curve will start during the life, if not immediately the project starts up. There are certain projects where you get an almost immediate upturn on the benefits graphic, but on loads of other projects, the benefits curve, that curve that I'm describing as the earned benefit line, won't happen until maybe handover of the project. You know, it won't, it won't even begin until handover of the project. And, uh, but the project is being created in order to make that benefit curve happen, you know, by whoever's created the business case in, in, a, uh, in, in government. So I suppose in, in, in quantum terms, I'm probably thinking about pretty big projects and not your, you know, your 30,000 or your 200,000 pound project. I'm thinking about your, you know, basically the, the sort of the usual suspect that you might apply earned value on, you know, it's 20 million and above um, billions of pounds. So uh, I, I don't quite know how you do that because I haven't seen it in practice yet. But I'm hearing mumblings from the IPA, uh, and I've asked a couple of times. They say, "Oh, we're going to we're, we're going to start measuring and and, uh, 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 and monitoring beneficial output." I think I don't know whether you've heard it, Dale. You're smiling, um, but I, 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 I've heard them talk about it, uh, and I've discussed it with other people who follow their pronouncements. I haven't seen any evidence. I'm still waiting to be told how they're measuring and and, and, and accounting for benefit. Yeah, I'm smiling um, because I haven't heard anything. Okay, um, <laughs> but they're they're saying the words, and again, you know, you, you hear seniors in in in, in government saying, um, you know, benefits about you know, it's all about benefits, it's all about purpose, it's all about social benefit and and leveling up and God knows what else. Well, there's got to be a way of measuring it in in, in some shape or form. And uh, as I said, for me, simplistically, 
but it also, you know, it would be predicated by using a decent earned value measurement system as well. Yeah. And uh, and I could even, I'd be, I'm even prepared to park the words earned value and just set, you know, just get government to measure physical accomplishment. Because don't tell anybody that's really what earned value is anyway. It's just physical accomplishment, status against cost, so that you, you know, you realise whether you're you're spending your money efficiently or, or not. So why not slap a benefits curve over there, particularly when the business case says this is going to create seventy billion pounds worth of benefits? Somebody must have done, sat there and done the sums, right? There must be somebody in the HS2 office that could do this for us. There are enough of them yeah. doing benefits. Uh, to say, well, we can, we, we, you know, and I, and all I'm saying to the benefits people, for example, is come into the project office at the very beginning, at the inception of a, a project, work with the project team to create a time phased decomposition model of that benefit over time. And if they can't, I would suggest that we're all being strong aligned, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so I'm... if you can measure and monitor that, and you say, and you embed it in some, maybe you give that responsibility to the audit office ultimately, maybe. and say maybe once you've got the not 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 the ownership of the benefit, but the responsibility and public duty, if you're talking about public spending, to somebody like the audit office to say, there's the line, you know. You don't have to specifically, you, you, you maybe have to manage the oversight of it so that in the in the early days, it might be government departments and the audit office is used to monitoring government departments. Then the delivery of the program, again, we've got the IPA to love to death to, to make sure that gets done. And then it goes out into society and it may be a question of, I don't know, monitoring local government or, 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 or uh, other aspects of, of, of other departments, you know, to the owning the owning uh, department within, you know, the NHS or uh, DWP or something like that, and so let's track this right the way through. Why? Because if the if the benefits tanking early on, rather like with earned value, you can switch it off. You might say it's not worth not not worth doing anymore. But similarly, you might be able to bring mitigation circumstances in which preserve that benefit in some way. But at least you can see it progressing, and and you can also start to assess whether your calculations about how you created the benefit in order to get it through a stage gate are valid why because if you're monitoring it you can feed that in that that information back iteratively into the originators of the business case i.e back to the originating department and forever preserving the link of ownership and responsibility as the torch for oversight passes down the line yeah yeah I've just made that up, Dave, but that sounds pretty <laughs> cogent, doesn't it? You know what? No, to, just yeah. to, to comment on that, and then I'll hand over to Martin. Um, I'm seeing this whole suite of, you know, if we have projects, we have a project manager, project controller. With benefits, you'll have a benefit manager, benefit controller, perhaps, if we if we want to you know, play mm. with it. But coming back into it, and as you say, it might not be cost that we measure. It might be earned benefits management, not earned value management, as you're saying. And it could be, you know, bringing into net zero, it could be yeah. carbon credits, right? That's how we perhaps measure it. And if you're not delivering those carbon credits or, or the value of those carbon credits, perhaps <clears throat> that's the measure. But um, I think there's a huge opportunity for the community to come together and go, how do we do this? Because yeah. as you say, let's put our collective minds together and we'll, we can come up with something. Yeah. Anyway... Well let, can I, can I, I've yeah. got to go again, Dale, sorry. Go for it. Because that, that, that's very, <laughs> well, it now gets me to what Val's question was, which was, how are you, Steve? And I was, okay. Uh, and so what did I do? I said, uh, control standard, what we're going to do is we are going to give, uh, and this, this rose out of a conversation with a program director of a very, very large airport telling me that all they were interested in as program director was the delivery of scope they couldn't give a monkeys about purpose or value or benefit as long as they delivered the scope and as long as they delivered the scope whether it was right or wrong that's what they delivered and that's what they were rewarded for by their organization and again it's a very I mean, it's an it's an awful dilemma because we we do know that the construction industry in general works on very very tight margins, two to three percent. 
So if you screw up in, in, in you know, even though there are huge sums of money at play, it's very easy to, to not make money in construction, even though there are these vast quantities. So, you know, arguably construction is held up by cash flow rather than by profitability. Um, and again, but, but again, even incremental uh, um, improvements in delivery practice can, 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 can therefore uh, bring out huge, huge returns. So, which, which you know, could be, again, uh, of great benefit. So, again, I was over lunch uh, talking to this guy and, uh, you know, and for me, it was a jaw dropping statement. I just thought, well, you know, if, if it's if, if there's that thinking that mentality at that level um it's not good really uh i didn't tell him but i was i was too polite but I, 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 I took it away and i just thought well what if we um i can't none of the bodies of knowledge none of the professional bodies say you should um actually be incorporating cradle to grave benefits management into your daily practice. And, and in a way, because of that, I, I also believe that the benefits management community has grown like Topsy because they haven't been integrated into daily project practice. And quite often they appear to be entirely divorced from the project management part of an organization. And again, one of the failures that we have rec recently or, or seen over the last few years is, is that lack of integration and harmonization of practice between the two communities. Um, it was a little bit like that with risk 25 years ago, where they sat in a separate room and seemed to do risk separately to, to the project's people and, and vice versa. They need to be integrated and harmonized. And again, if I was to say there was one bad note I'd give to organizations that have SIGs, that have got project in their name. Uh, I would say what you should do is halt a SIG every 12, uh, every year or two, and say, integrate everything you've done back into the body of knowledge, you know, into the corpus of, of, of project management, get it properly integrated, you know, so it's like take the engine out, because a SIG basically is the crazed mechanic, having got the engine out, De decomposed it, built built all, all sorts of stuff around it, but only within their specialist bit of the engine. And then when they found that they need to get it back under the bonnet, it doesn't fit properly because it's bulging out somewhere, you know. So that they haven't they haven't integrated it back. And there isn't there doesn't appear to be an integration phase or a reintegration phase or a realignment or a harmonisation phase with what the work and activities of specific interest groups, which is why every specific interest group, myself included, sees everything through their own lens. And so when you speak to a benefits management zealot, it's just benefits management. You speak to agile, it's just agile. You know, it, 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 it's, it, it's um, and, and, you know, the eyes have gone glazed and you don't know whether they're going to snarl at you or, 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 or what, but they just, they, it, it produces a blinkered thinking process. So I, um, again, informing all my thinking, I thought, well, what if we produced a control standard, which actually encouraged, permitted and said, you really should, and you do have permission to, review uh, an idea from a controls perspective from cradle to grave, i.e. from the inception of an idea through to its definition as a, uh, of a benefit through business case into the creation of the projects and programs that are going to deliver it through the execution and then out the other end into use, into delivery. Well, at all times feeding back uh, to, uh, to, to inform the whatever learning legacy or learning systems there are. <clears throat> and so that model was put to a very large group of project and program directors who I happen to be very friendly with, not friendly with, but no. Um, and uh, they said, yeah, go on. Uh, let's have a go. And that's became the 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 uh, the arch, if you like, the narrative boundary of, of what the controls standard that, that, that I'm working on with a group of particularly practitioners to produce. It's called BS 20-2001. Can you play the music, Dale? 2001. And um, I, I uh, said, well, once we've got that permission granted, um, 
then we've potentially got something which will steer people towards working in that way because it's joining up some of these statements that have been made about you need a business case but it's got to be joined to project activity that's got to be ha have the benefits have to be tracked right the way through the life cycle and blah blah so i've I, i'm hopeful that the what we're creating with the standard is the platform upon which that activity can take place on a national scale and one of the significant differences or, or the unique features unique because I think it's the first one in the management standards group is that it's called a specification standard so it's not like BS 6079 a guide for information it's called a specification standard and the specification standard is full of shall and should statements it's effectively a cockpit check it's a requirements list of what you should do you should think about what you shall have and you should have when you are setting up the framework the harness for project controls to exist within whatever undertaking you are undertaking, even if you're an undertaker, yeah? So you've got uh, this set of requirements. You shall do this, you should do this, you should have risk management, you should do benefits management, all of those things, a big stack of them. And uh, again, whilst you have to be compliant with them, you can also positively exclude yourself from each of these. So in order to get this standard, which will, which will be ultimately accessible, you can say, well, we can do numbers one to 20, but we can't do 30 to 40 because, and as long as you've documented that in a rational way, it means that you don't have to be, you have to be compliant in the sense that you've considered every requirement. And if, you, and if there are some exclusions, by all means, exclude them, but give a bloody good reason why, so that somebody who comes around and has a look can see why you've done that. Yeah. The other attractive feature of this is that the far end, the assurance end, the certification end, is effectively a mirror image, a mirror statement of the requirement. You should do this. The requirement statement is show me. You should do this. Show me. That's your assurance regime uh, questionnaire. The bit in the middle, the how to space, the bit for geniuses like Dale to come and tell you how to come and do this, or if it were me, this is how I would do it, or if you were to change the way you operated, this is how you could do it. We're leaving open, cleverly, archly, because we don't know. The users are the best people, the organizations are the best people. If the organization has got the expertise and the wherewithal because it's got the local knowledge of how it conducts its own business and how it wants to conduct its own business, um, that's great. Uh, and they're probably the best people to determine that. But they now have a framework that they can work in, which will be nationally applicable that everybody can look at. And I would hope because of the numbers of organizations that a know about the standard coming b have expressed interest and support in it and also contributed to its elaboration they not only do they know about it but when we lob it over the fence it won't be a surprise and it won't just land up on the bookshelf it will be what i i hope and i i refer to as they will pull it into use because it's the thing they've been waiting for OK, often standards are lobbed over the fence. They appear as a diary item by a, a friendly association and they disappear without trace. Mm -hmm. OK, like, you know, like a, I don't know, a one hit wonder kind of thing. Uh, and, and everybody forgets about it. And, and, and the trouble is that a lot of people in high places think job done. And I'd say that for the TSO's publication of benefits management, portfolio management, agile, you know, everybody thinks they've done it because they've written the textbook. No, no, nobody has the framework to pull it into use or the, or the permission to do that. Again, the gamble is that a, a British standard that is a set of specification requirements will be far easier to define in contract, uh, to inform statements of work, to inform curricula for, for training and professional development, and a whole variety of uses and to define certification and therefore be part of a legal instrument, which again comes to if it ain't in the contract, it will be possible to apply this in the contract to improve contract practice. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, how you change the world or you change or you, you try and bring about 
change into a community by using yeah. the leverage of a national uh, 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 commonly recognized and commonly available uh, instrument. Yeah, thanks, I rest Dave. my we, case. You've, uh, you've done excellently well um, throughout this entire pod. We've just been in awe of your demonstration of knowledge and, and your crusade. I mean, you really are spearheading a lot of this. And I think standards are where it starts. You know, we need to get that right. Um, and my question was short, but I will hand over to Martin in a second, was really around the incentive because a lot of the time the benefits realization or even the benefits management relies heavily on the client side of the project. And so my, my question, which hopefully is a short one, Steve, sorry for time, is how short. do we incentivize, incentivize contractors to be, you know, kind of gearing towards benefits as well? Because it, as you said, if it's not in the contract and if it's not a shelled out, they won't do it. Um, and, and obviously the, there is profit and margin that they need to consider when they do look at benefits margin, especially when it's, it's in the future. Hmm. Um, you know, humans aren't, in, we aren't very good at, you know, saving for the future. We, we care about today uh, and tomorrow is another problem uh, that we, we, we tend to put as a secondary priority. But what, what's your short comment on that? Um, you're right, Val. Uh, well, again, yes, that, that, that's why I, I've tried to do it this way. Um, because again, if you, want, if you want change, it's gotta be, it's gotta be easy to assimilate in, in big numbers. And we're, so we're not asking for people to do anything that they don't know about or that they haven't got ideas of or indeed that they don't have the techniques in place to do that. And I can't imagine giving uh, a project controls person another, another bit of information to take a, a variance check, pulse check uh, every month uh, from is going to be an enormous burden. Um, if anything, it's, it's a win-win for the controls profession. They're all worrying about being automated into oblivion by machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm saying, well, here's another bit that will prove that you're, you're doing a decent job. So em embrace that and uh, hopefully that will raise and lift their profile up. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's firstly the incentivization of if it's in the contract, people will do it. I also think it needs to be uh, the inclusion of benefits in particular and societal benefit feed into the mindset of saving the planet, of circular economy, of uh, degrowth, of, of, of carbon zero. Uh, yeah. And uh, you've already had the responsible project management people on, but again, it sets yeah. the tone and the control suite that's required for a more responsible approach to project management. You know, so, so again, it fits in with the, the uh, I, I suppose, the culture, the zeitgeist that, that needs to be created and that we can take part in. And again, if you want to lead a good life, then you know become a become a, a project manager that has a responsible approach that is doing these practices and uh, and uh, um, actually making them happen, you know, rather than just wishing. And I and I believe that what we're offering up here are is a tangible way of doing it, you know that that is it that is acceptable as well. So we're not out in the street extinction rebellion. We're actually saying these are this is a tool that can be used by everybody for the benefit of all. What do you think, Dale? You agree, don't you? I do agree. I think Martin do. agrees even more than me, yeah. though. <laughs> Does he? <laughs> no, you, you mentioned earlier the projects leaving the government major project portfolio uh, yeah. document. I've just been reading that in the background. Some quite interesting stuff in there. Um, the last version of the report I found is 2018. and That's the one. I'm, that must be the one. And one of, so... One of the headlines is there's 657 billion pound of benefits to be delivered by the projects in and? there. I suppose my question is, it's a lot, there's, there's, a few, there's a few good recommendations in there, but very sensible and they pretty much all tally with, with what you said yeah. so far. That was 2018. What have been the development since then as stuff moved on in a positive well, or negative way? Well, in your opinion. If only this is being filmed. On the 16th and 17th of March, uh, is EVA 26, the 26th incarnation of my project, which basically is the synthesis of all the ideas that I've spoken about tonight. Uh, that's what EVA has become. Um, but they're good ideas and it brings this community together again. Uh, we've all aged a bit, so we're all also in positions where we can maybe bring more power and influence to bear rather than the worry beats. And um, significantly um, speaking, uh, on day one, I think, is Emma Wilson, 
who is in charge of uh, major projects audit and for the um, I think the knowledge portal or the knowledge part of sharing knowledge by by the audit office. So she'll be talking to um, the fact that the audit office is now far more geared up than it used to be in the early days to come out and share its intelligence. Um, and promote and recommend its intelligence, not only to the government community who are on the receiving end of audit reports, but to the, you know, the community at large, the, the supply chain, if you like, you know, because again, it's all very well telling government departments to do it, but the reality is it's the supply chain that's going to have to deliver this stuff, because government doesn't roll those things up and go and dig the road up. It's, it's a bunch of contractors, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, first, so, so there's that that, that often blocks um, what, what seem to be really great words by government because they don't go and do the job. Uh, and Emma's coming along and um, in similar vein, I know that she is dead keen on pursuing this benefits line and still trying to find out. So I think the answer to your supposition is has a great deal happened since 2018? Well, COVID's happened, but I think that's going to be the excuse. Um, valid. But uh, it hasn't stopped us thinking or preparing for it or trying to, to bring the, 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 these things into being. And as I said, at the moment, I've worked hard, very hard, I think even as Dale knows, and you've, known, you've only known me for a couple of years, to, to, to sort of bring this. And, uh, and it's, it's a, it's a long-term thing. You know, it, it is shifting tectonic plates of, of thinking uh, together to try and lumber them into place in some way. Um, uh, uh, and a lot of it is about changing attitudes, opening people's minds to new ways of thinking. Um, and it, dare I say that the odd crisis or two, um, and I'm not referring to the very awful stuff that's going on in Ukraine at the moment, but you need something maybe like COVID to change the people, the way people approach their lives and their worlds. You know, maybe it's made them a bit kinder, not nice. As I said, I avoid the word nice. Uh, Australians are nice, but they're not well, kind. Are we? And, um, uh, well, you know what I mean. And um, you, you, it, you, if it makes us kinder in approach, um, then uh, I think ideas sort of come up and down with the opportunity to do them. And you get this sort of perfect storm. Well, I'm almost thinking that we're in this 18 months of perfect storm coming up so that if this control standard becomes available and if we can get a real push on trying to interleave that with you know, genuine uh, improvements through focus on beneficial delivery, but in t you know, uh, uh, we, which is getting people really to buy those ideas and to get spooked into carbon zero or how are we, what's going to happen if the gas, to, well, referring to Ukraine, what if we really do shut off the gas from Russia? Um, you know, we're going to get very cold uh, in, in the UK. At the moment, I hear tonight that, that, that that's not part of the embargo plan, which in a sense disgusts me. But wow. I, I, I just think surely that will focus all of our attentions on going into alternative forms of fuel. Uh, far more rapidly than we would have done, because, quite frankly, what do you remember about COP26 last November? Nothing. Yeah. I bet nothing. Or indeed, what the what the uh, the blandishments that were offered were going to be. Absolutely nothing. It's all but, been uh, taken over but, by Vince. Yeah. But yeah. But, all, but all this. Uh, I think will sharpen and focus people so that if you place these kinds of ideas with an instrument with which to take it forward, you might actually get something. We might not get the whole way there, but it's, that, it's also that thing of I look back 20, 30 years now and think we, an awful lot's changed and, and an awful lot of things have happened, even though it doesn't feel like it when it's going on at the minute. It just feels like, you know, walking through treacle at the moment. Yeah. But I, I know that we're making progress and I know that some of us, um, because I don't claim to, sh to share it all, but I'm certainly part of it, but I know that some of us have got, I don't know, a focus or a vision to just try and push it that way. Well, Steve, um, you know, we, we, we thank you for your crusade, as Val was saying, because it's, it's yeah. lifelong work that you've put into this. And, and, you know, if not for folks like yourself, I don't think we'd be in the place we are today. So thank you 
on behalf yeah. of, of everyone. But we do have to just mention before we end the podcast, you know, you did mention the EVA mm-hmm. 26 for those of us that are around in London. The uh, is it the 16th and 17th of March? I got the yep. date right. 17th of March is St. Patrick's Day. Dale's going to dress up like a leprechaun, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, folks, the Project Chatter podcast will be there uh, supporting Steve and EVA 26. Uh, We'll be interviewing all of the presenters, uh, getting a synopsis uh, of of what they they spoke Mm -hmm. about, their topics. So, hugely exciting. It's been two years of absence. So, uh, I'm really, really looking forward to it, Steve. And um, I think it's going to be a fantastic event. But look, before we let you go, are there any final thoughts you want to leave our listeners with? Well, a uh, couple of things. Um, the con- well, link to the conference. Um, so forgive me for shameless advertising. If you go, if you go online, there's a 26% discount. Um, uh, the cost of the conference is cheap. Two days and dinner is cheaper than one day without dinner from my former glorious partners, the APM. So a bargain. Uh, also, 16 very meaty hours of CPD or units, if you depending on which, whether you're a, an institute or an association. And finally, um, because those that know my broadcast series, um, uh, we we had a poet in residence in there, you know, summarising each program. Um, through him, we've managed to to, to get Michael Rosen. Uh, in on the program he's going to be talking about the humanity in large organizations and drawing very much on his experiences within hospital uh, when he uh, was fighting for his life uh, suffering from covid over the last couple of years Um, and again i think we'll be talking very much about this notion of don't be nice be kind and uh, it's the small acts of kindness that uh, get us through life Um, and the thing that keeps me going again is that long, long network of connection and, and acts of kindness from, from the people that, that I've gone, which makes all the, the horrible stuff and the nasty bastards go away. Um, and the fact that I feel as though I'm doing something worthwhile. You're absolutely the awesome. feeling that you're doing something worthwhile keeps you going. Yeah, you absolutely are. And we'll post the link in the show notes. So folks do just Thank go you. ahead and click on that and all the information will be there. But you can also hit Steve up on LinkedIn. He's open yeah. to talking yeah. to anyone as well. What, one other punt on my, my interview program is uh, I, I call it the cartoon railroad. So we're forever putting sleepers down, i.e. people to be interviewed uh, in that. Uh, every Thursday at four o'clock. I've done 60 since um, October the 1st, 2020, in response to not being able to do a physical conference. If you feel that you'd like to have me interview you for about half an hour to an hour, get in touch and um, come along and talk. I, I'm, um, I'm a kind host. <laughs> Far kinder than we are. Steve. Thank you very Far much. Kinder. Anyway, Far nice. Kinder. thank you very much, you guys. That's uh, been a nice chat again. And um, it's a good thing I wasn't feeling all good and chipper, wasn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have gone on forever. Val, any final thoughts from you? Final whistle. No, thanks, Steve. Again, um, a linguistic labyrinth of, of fascinating stories from the standards as well. And, and again, thanks for your contribution to our craft. It's, it's always appreciated, even over the pond. You know, Australians don't always Ooh. catch up as fast. Ooh, by the way, I'm, I'm coming to Canberra in August. <laughs> oh, mate, I'll see you there. I'll yeah. see you there. You uh, tell there's me. a PGCS conference going on. I think a um, guy called Kim Henderson does it. Um, uh, takes right. place in Canberra. I'll be there in... Mid, Mid-August and in Sydney. Let's go for, yeah. let's go for a pint. Uh, Canberra, we Sydney, Melbourne, we're, all, we're very close to each other, Several. so uh, I'll fly over. Okay. But, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for your time, thanks Steve. We really appreciate it, mate. Cheers. Well, folks, as you've heard, that is all the time we have. But remember, before you go, if you've enjoyed what you've heard, you can help us pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your favorite social media. Once again, a massive thank you to our guest today, Mr. Steve Wake. And thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me, Val, and Martin, it's bye for now. (laughs) 